thank you very much the audience for staying with us here and uh, I see that there are still almost uh, all the people from uh, the morning so <coughs> we are looking forward to very fascinating discussions but let me first briefly introduce the, the speakers, the panelists and then say some words about the, the topic and the, the issue we're going to discuss on this panel. Um, so um, on the right side, on your left side actually, um, is sitting Ray Matters, he's currently councillor um, in the South African Embassy in Berlin and um, he had several stays in, in different countries including Japan and Malaysia and um, he actually has a dis degree uh, in, in history. Um, next to me uh, is um, sitting Wolfgang Niedermark. He is the vice president of the BASF group, Communication and Government Relations, based here in Berlin. Uh, he as well had several stays uh, outside Germany on a global level. He was in Seoul, uh, among other things. Um, on my left side is sitting Harald Klein. He is currently the general counselor of Germany in Brazil, working in Rio de Janeiro. Um, he as well had several stays in, in different, especially Latin American countries, including uh, Mexico. And uh, he will actually present the, the German view uh, on Brazil and, and uh, perspectives from, from Latin America. Uh, and last but not least um, is uh, Dirk Lölke. He's working in the Foreign Ministry and is the head of the department responsible for emerging countries. Um, and we're looking forward to his uh, statements as well. I actually uh, would suggest that the gentleman uh, has every, uh, everybody has his, um, his statement roughly about eight to ten minutes. And um, then we will have a general discussion directly after the statements. So I ask the audience to, to um, write down or to keep in mind your questions related to the statements so that we can go to it back later and have a general discussion. Um, maybe, uh, Ray, you start first. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you for the opportunity to present on this input on South Africa. <coughs> organized by the Frederick Neumann Foundation. I'd just like to start by saying that the scholarly inputs this morning were excellent. So thank you very much. Um, they were really good. I, I can't promise I'm going to keep to the same standard, but um, I've jotted down a few notes here. Um, I will give a few examples why I think South Africa is um, punching above its weight Maybe an analogy in Germany would be to say playing in the Champions League and provide some reasons as to why we choose certain options before providing a brief input on the political and economic situation in South Africa. In the mid 1990s, the saying South Africa cannot be an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty was very popular within my department. For that reason, neighboring countries, especially the Southern African Development Community, or SADC, and Africa, are located centrally in our foreign policy. Many of our foreign policy achievements and objectives feature and prioritize Africa. However, Africa is also the only region with which South Africa has trade surpluses. When there is conflict in many sub-Saharan African countries, refugees and migrants, they come to my country. So a peaceful and prosperous Africa is in our interest. Some ammunition to support the punching above the weight theory. In the last 19 years, South Africa served two terms as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. It is the only African country represented at the G20 became a member of IPSA, joined BRICS in 2010, a former South African foreign minister now serves as chairperson of the AU Commission. We have been and are involved in conflict resolution and peace building in Africa. So what do we want from the international community? We have cons consistently stated that the security architecture 
in which five UN Security Council permanent members have veto <coughs> powers needs to be changed and brought into alignment with global realities. In global political and financial organizations, the management structures should be reflective of current <coughs> realities with enhanced representation in the decision-making processes. We ask the international community for meaningful changes. With Germany, we have a strategic partnership and we conduct our relations on an equal basis. We are eager to gain Germany's cooperation and support in the identification and implementation of joint programs in third African countries, um, for example, triangular cooperation. Where it was in our interest to reach out and to strengthen relations with democratic and like-minded countries facing similar developmental challenges such as ourselves. We did the India-Brazil-South Africa or IPSA dialogue forum was established in 2003 focusing on intergovernmental cooperation. When BRIC was formed, we thought it was in our national interest to join it. Although the systems of government of BRIC countries differed, <coughs> their agenda of working towards the restructuring of global governance to be more equitable and balanced was compatible with our foreign policy objectives of South-South cooperation and expanding cooperation with developing countries. We were part of IPSA and had good ties with China and Russia, so at the outset we thought we had a reasonable chance of getting in to the organization. Earlier this year, when South Africa hosted the 5th BRIC Summit meeting, the theme was BRICS in Africa, Partnership for Development, Integration and Industrialization. We invited and 12 African Union heads of state, the chairperson of the African Union Commission and leaders from the African regional economic communities attended the BRICS Leaders African Dialogue meeting. The objective was to promote the African agenda to support infrastructure development and alternative access to finance through promoting the creation of a BRICS development bank. I'd like to state that BRICS is not directed against any group of countries. However, emerging countries will look for potential partners to attain similar goals. We also continue to strengthen our partnerships with countries of the North. In the two terms that South Africa served as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, we sponsored resolutions encouraging closer cooperation between the UN Security Council and the regional organization that is the African Union. In dealing with peace and security issues in Africa, we believe that African solutions are required for African problems. In 2050, one in four people in the world will be African. Therefore, it would be crucial for Africa to obtain a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Already, 70% of the agenda of that institution deals with African issues. Therefore, in our view, emerging countries like us should provide leadership in issues affecting our region. This we have done in the past 20 years and will continue to do so. This is an opportunity for the international order and I feel the challenge is how do we bring this into the formal structures that currently exist. The image of the South African National Defence Force helicopters um, flying and rescuing flood victims in our neighbouring country, Mozambique, um, affected by rising flood waters, which is, in a season, which is a seasonal occurrence, would have been unthinkable more than 20 years ago. My department is in the process of, this, of establishing a development organisation called SADPA that would deal with development assistance to southern or to um, countries. I think that emerging countries providing ODA is a development that should be welcomed. It indicates a willingness to share, take responsibility and contribute to the international community. I'd like to turn to the political, um, political and economic part briefly.
And say so last week I had the opportunity to see the release of the new Nelson Mandela film, The Long Walk to Freedom. It, it's an excellent movie and I highly recommend that the audience that try and see it. It's coming out in Germany in February next year. But I think, you know, the movie is a stark reminder from where South Africa has come from. You know, our country was on the verge of falling apart. That was the reality. In South Africa now, we've had five democratic elections in the country. Oh, you know, no, sorry, we've had four. We'll be having the next one in April next year. The past four elections have been won by the African National Congress with over 60% of the vote. The opposition Democratic Alliance in the last election won 16% of the vote. We expect the ANC to win the next election. Overcoming the legacies of apartheid and transformation requires ongoing efforts. Inequality and unemployment remain at, ex at unacceptably high levels. With our youth unemployment at similar levels to Greece and Spain, this is a serious challenge for us. We are engaging with the BMBF to develop um, programs aimed at strengthening vocational training in South Africa. Our constitution is forward-looking and excellent. The courts in the country are independent. Civil society is vigorous and there's freedom of media. For an economy that addressed the needs of 5 million people to now address the needs of 40 million people, it's like an aeroplane in the air and while it's flying you try and change the engine. It's a very difficult task. You know, we might have missed some opportunities in the golden decade, but there have been gains. The GDP is 400 billion US dollars. Our economy has grown by 80% since 1993. You know, there are other areas, like 3 million homes have been built, electrification has been expanded, water and sanitation that's been provided. At this time, there are more than 15 million people eligible for social grants and receiving social grants. We realize growth is too slow, households are over-indebted, government expenditure exceeds revenue. We import more than we export. And we know that unless we save and invest more, unless we expand and diversify our economy, unless we accelerate job creation, the aspirations will remain unfulfilled. We've got a national development plan that targets a GDP growth of 5.4% to 2030, which we hope will create an estimated 11 million jobs that we're currently working on and implementing. It's a long-term long vision. Um, I'd just like to briefly highlight some um, projects that are in progress. Um, power, uh, construction of power stations is underway. Rail capacity has been expanded. We're supporting regional infrastructure development in Africa, roads in Angola, energy projects in Tanzania and the DRC. We've got an expanded public works program that created around one million jobs last year. We hope to expand that. Um, you know, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd conclude by saying there are challenges in South Africa. We accept them. We try and overcome them. We're looking for the, for the positives in South Africa. There's much to celebrate, and we look forward to celebrating 20 years of democracy next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray, for your short talk. Um, next is um, um, Zanita Mauk. Um, yeah, thank you, Zanita um, my task is now to uh, tell you our storyline, our view on emerging markets. Uh, our, that means the BSF, the chemical company, largest chemical company in the world and uh, represented everywhere, also in the big emerging companies, uh, countries. And uh, how do we see these emerging markets? And you, what you have mentioned to my Asia background, I will focus more or less on China, perhaps India. Uh, but uh, you can uh, expect that we have a similar view on uh, all the others, on Russia, on, on uh, Brazil, South Africa, and, and all other countries who offer um, this challenge or um, yeah, danger for us. Yeah? Uh, that is always the main question, um, and it's not the first time that I'm talking about this question. How do you see as a big company this threat or opportunity and what we don't like is um, the biased uh, public opinion on that so what you find here is, is something like that normally I have also these nice powerpoints today I was asked uh, to do it without but I cannot help to show you such things this is public 
uh, uh, public campaigning, China and others are a threat for us. It's an invasion, uh, something ugly is happening, it's bad for us. And we have to be aware, yeah? it's, it's really rubbish. And or, or this one, yeah? uh, it's only on rivalry and, and we are threatened and uh, it's not only the so-called simple uh, papers like Bild, it's also uh, Spiegel and Focus who do such things. And, um, and also the economist is not better. Uh, it's not only in Germany. For example, this one, I don't have the original paper. That was from September. Uh, and you have something um, like Schadenfreunde. Uh, you cannot explain it in English. I think uh, there's no uh, translation for it. But you are laughing about somebody who is in trouble. And of course, of course there are some people in trouble now. Uh, China is, is perhaps still ahead, but all are not as strong as they used to be. So, is that a reason for us to, uh, to laugh about? No, absolutely not. Uh, what we need is um, opportunities and markets, and companies like BSF look for additional markets. Of course, we are strong in Europe, uh, but this is more or less stagnation. Yeah? Uh, there is no, not much momentum in Europe. We hope that there will be recovery, but uh, we see some uh, momentum in, in the United States due to the shale gas revolution, um, the industry, there's a renaissance of industry, but that's also nice to have. The real uh, big opportunities are in the emerging markets, uh, very obvious. And um, for BSF, I can tell you 20% is in Asia, 5% um, uh, Latin America and Africa is beginning to play a role for us. And there are those people who would like to have a better life, uh, who would like to see uh, some products we are enjoying here in, in uh, the industrialized countries. Of course, people would like to see cars, they would like to have furniture, they would like to have better buildings with energy, energy efficiency, uh, they would like to have their fridges and so on. These are the markets of the future and I think um, we have uh, a good chance to uh, play a role in developing these markets. The markets will come and there is a need, uh, and there is a demand and for us as a global company this is not a threat at all, that is a big opportunity. And um, so we are really bullish on China, on Brazil, on all these countries because they need our technologies and products. And we have a good recipe to enter these markets because um, as you all know, in China and Russia and other countries, uh, there is perhaps a, a certain lack of sustainability uh, understanding. Perhaps the understanding is already given, but the possibilities to act in a sustainable way, uh, seeing the needs to bring people uh, out of poverty, um, are perhaps a little bit more urgent than uh, only looking on sustainability. What we bring as a multinational is this, multi, uh, this um, sustainability approach. So our standards um, in environmental protection, our standards also in social protection, in labor protection, um, our values. Um, we are not interfering in these uh, markets as a political stakeholder directly, but indirectly of course we uh, strive for improvement also on these levels. And since we are better prepared to cope with this um, uh, environment, and so uh, what we are looking forward to is good governance and uh, a positive development, as you described it, uh, also uh, for South Africa and your neighboring countries. And so um, that is our main uh, positive approach. And of course, we can prove that um, we are investing additionally not instead of, uh, but additionally. So what we, we don't find is that we close down factories here in Germany. By the way, it's also not possible to close down the largest integrated chemical plant in the world in Ludwigshafen. You simply do not close down such a thing. Yeah? Uh, we need it, that's the basis. All our investments in emerging markets are additionally. So we enter new markets. It's not a threat for Ludwigshafen. It's in addition. 
Uh, so we have the largest single investment of BSF history in Nanjing, in China. Several billions we invested in a Verbundstandort, as we call it, also a term you cannot translate into English, uh, where everything is connected in a very efficient way. We have such a thing in Nanjing. We have it for uh, ASEAN uh, as a group of new uh, emerging countries in Malaysia. And um, so um, we are really um, trying to make more uh, of, out of these markets and um, the concept is sustainability. Um, one l last point I would say is um, in conquering these markets and that is our ambition. Um, it's not only that we uh, strive for uh, good governance and, and uh, interact and advocate for that from the German point of view, what we would like to see is that this is done from a European perspective. What we do is we present BSF more as a European company and not as a German. Of course, it's not uh, always um, too clear. We, we have the German roots, very clear. We have uh, the made in Germany image and we like it. But uh, what we would like to see more is to set on the uh, European card and, and to play the European uh, uh, card in order to get relevance in our political and economical application in those markets. Um, we think um, in the long run that is a better concept and uh, perhaps you can go into detail later. But this is our very positive storyline for China, Brazil and elsewhere. It's not a threat, it's a challenge and um, we are prepared to, to do it. Thank you very much for this um, a very positive um, uh, statement and um, I think this links perfectly to Mr. Lurke and uh, leading to the question of course, is it really only a positive sum game or do we have or do the foreign ministry have a different view on this? Thank you very much. Yes, I intend to say, give you some headlines before our colleague, the Consul General, uh, will sort of um, exemplify what we see from headquarters by giving us the, uh, the view from, from Brazil. The rise of the South, um, to quote this famous UNDP document, is of course a fact that we uh, can and should um, embrace. We have heard about the positive effects. It's certainly no zero sum game, and it does not mean necessarily a decline of the West if we do not allow this happen. First of all, and foremost, the rise of the South reduced poverty. Hundreds of millions of people came out of uh, dire poverty, and new middle classes are rising all over the world, which um, seems to be a very positive thing for us, because middle classes, as, li as uh, we think, should have more or less the same uh, ideas and ideas that we have, like they are looking for good education for their children, they want a clean environment, and they want to buy, of course, German cars as we have, and fridges as we have um, heard. So middle class is a thing that we uh, embrace too. And another positive um, uh, issue is good governance apparently uh, seem to play an important, good governance, not necessarily democracy, good governance played an important role in this development of the rise of the South and um, most poor countries in this world, most poor countries in the world are poorly governed too. So we'll all benefit from these developments if we manage the challenge, challenges of this enormous changes worldwide. Because um, on the other side of the development, we see the international order, um, the international post war or cold war order coming under stress. New global players question the post-war order. UN, WTO, IMF, World Bank today still mirror the post-war uh, order. They haven't been um, thoroughly reformed and they urgently need to be overhauled. The Security Council seems to be unable to solve even the most outrageous challenges. The Syria um, issue recently is maybe only an exception. We still have to be seen how this to see how this will develop. WTO 
seems to be unable to conclude the Doha round. The United Nations climate conferences are not too successful. So um, we see that the so-called effective multilateralism, as we call it, um, is not really functioning. Uh, too effective. The bigger new global players are no longer prepared to accept the uh, setting of this world order. They meet, they are meeting in smaller, informal, more or less informal uh, circles. They are starting to bypass the UN institutions and a multipolar world is emerging. And this is something that we, uh, I would like to underline this, do not really like very much for us. The <coughs> concept always has been effective multilateralism. Everybody inside the United Nations these three circles of German uh, foreign policy, the EU, the NATO, and then the uh, uh, United Nations is still very much in our um, uh, in the forefront of our, of our heads. So a multipolar world with balances of power, big powers who are trying to um, implement um, their aims is not exactly what we, are, what we would uh, look for from um, from Berlin. So, the, um, and also Germany is, of course, a middle sized country. Do not believe uh, the articles in newspapers that uh, Germany in the European Union, last man standing, and so on. At the end of the day, we are 80 million, the EU are 500 million, and um, the global bigger players are uh, definitely uh, stronger than we are. So, we would of course favor uh, a um, reform of the existing organizations of the international order into a new rules-based transparent uh, general international system and we would favor this um, um, and not sort of um, uh, would have the tendency not be in favor of creating new organizations uh, parallel to the existing once. This is something that you should keep in mind. Let's take the BRICS as an, because we have mentioned as an example of what um, seems to be or may lead to a continuous fragmentation of the world. You know, it's a bit ironic, I would say, that the, the BRICS countries, after the Goldman Sachs study has invented this abbreviation, this acronym, started to meet. Um, but they are continuing to do so. We know that there is a lack of let's say, ideological unity inside this uh, BRICS groups. They have not so many common aims, except that they don't accept the, um, parts of the existing setting of the international order, but they are meeting continuously at different fora. It's not always easy to find out what they uh, have um, negotiated uh, about, and they are also starting uh, something like an institutionalizing effort. Um, there are first uh, decisions on the currency exchange reserve and uh, on the horizon we uh, see perhaps a BRICS bank forced bypassing ex existing uh, institutions. And um, frankly we would prefer uh, that uh, BRICS countries will exert their responsibility inside the existing international organizations, which of course have to be uh, urgently reformed to underline this uh, um, again. Then, what we did last year, last thing I mentioned, is a, um, the German government adopted a, um, a strategy uh, which is called Shaping Globalization, Expanding Partnerships, Sharing Responsibility which frames our policy vis-a-vis -vis the new global players, which we call a German Neue Gestaltungsmächte. I now use this term Neue Gestaltungsmächte, global players, more than, than, than Schwellenländer here than emerging countries, because I think they are now, have emerged, have emerged uh, enough. Um, and we, um, at the moment, uh, are uh, drafting um, strategy papers for each of these uh, bigger global players inside the government in sort of interministerial steering groups chaired by the uh, Federal Foreign Office. Short political papers which outline our aims and the aims of, the, of our partner and try to figure out common ground for, for cooperation. We always 
planning to establish a new fora for networking with these new players on certain horizontal issues like uh, water, climate, uh, energy. And also to dovetail this national strategy, because it's a national strategy, with the EU strategic partnerships. Of course, very important not to, uh, not to have um, different approaches at different um, levels. So, um, to sum it up, yes, it's a very positive, uh, it's a very, very positive um, development. If we managed, if we managed, but this is a big if, um, a um, reform of the of our existing um, existing international order, um, and that means the a reform of the existing organizations of the United Nations, um, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lerke, for this really interesting remarks. I think there's much room later to debate how exactly the, the German position is, and I, I'm personally really interested in, in uh, hearing more about um, the new German strategy to be formulated at the moment. And last but not least, we go now to uh, the Councillor General, uh, Mr. Klein, um, giving a council. Sorry, giving. Uh, I'm sorry, giving a. a a, um, a view from from a, a more a perspective based in Brazil. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for uh, uh, preparing this uh, very interesting topic and this very interesting meeting. Uh, I would like to. I don't fear. I, I will not uh, do any uh, PowerPoint presentation. But uh, in order to have a certain kind of illustration of what I'm talking about, I put these two. Uh, front pages of the Economist. One, the left one, uh, the, the the left one from 2009, and the right one from 2013. Uh, that gives a bit the uh, framework for the discussion uh, on on Brazil as an emerging economy and on the situation in Brazil and on the perspectives in in, in Brazil. Uh, I don't know whether there is somebody from the Brazilian embassy here here present uh, uh, because I will also pick up a bit. Uh, the weak points uh, of the uh, of Brazil uh, in 2013, and I know that uh, in, in China, in, in South Africa, in, in Brazil, and in Russia, uh, people don't like to discuss uh, a lot on the, on the weak points. Uh, but I think we have to mention them in order to understand uh, what has to be done and what is going on in, in, in these countries. Let me start with some. Uh, uh, statistical data. We had already in the morning some information on the on the emerging economies, but uh, now I'm concentrating uh, my uh, uh, my uh, presentation on on Brazil. Um, I talk some weak points, and then I will I will talk about some some strong points of, of Brazil. The weak points: uh, the uh, gross domestic product per capita is 11,400 US dollars. You saw Chile with 18,000. It is good in comparison for the part to the past, but it's not yet uh, good in comparison to the uh, advanced countries. We, Brazil is with 11,400 US dollars on the 53rd uh, position in the world. Uh, in the PISA study on, on the educational performance, uh, uh, Brazil is also on the uh, 53rd uh, position out of 65 countries investigated and, and, and checked uh, with, the, with the PISA study. Competitiveness, that was a topic also in the, in the discussions in the morning on China. In competitiveness, uh, Brazil is on the 56th place in the world. Uh, in comparison, Chile, Chile is in 34th, 34th, and South Korea in 25th uh, uh, place in the competitiveness index. We, one can discuss the, the indices, whether they are really uh, uh, showing uh, the, the real uh, situation, but uh, as a benchmark, I think it's very, it's very important. The Human Development Index, Brazil even worse, in 85, plays 85. Argentina is in 45, and Mexico in 61. Um, taxes in relation to per capita income, there Brazil is on the higher rankings, in the 12th place of all OECD countries, but only on the 30th place if you consider the return of benefits for the taxpayer. And so that shows a little uh, certain uh, uh, difference. Other weak points, uh, 
In the Freedom Index, it was mentioned this morning, they are free, economic freedom index, they are only in 101st place of out of 150, 52 countries. Um, they have a relatively low investment rate. The foreign direct investment is actually about 3%, but the, the, the prognostics are going, uh, are, are uh, 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 thinking of a decrease of uh, to 2.3 percent in the next years uh, from uh, cross domestic product. Uh, we have res resuming. We have relatively weak basic education. We have a high tax burden in Brazil. We have a complicated tax system. Additionally, there is a low productivity of the uh, uh, Brazilian enterprises. Uh, there is a low rate uh, of investment, uh, national investment. Only 16% of, uh, of the gross domestic product is invested. In China and in India, you have about 30-35%. And that is, a, that is quite a, a, a difference. Uh, then, more general observation, uh, there is no clear growth strategy in Brazil. It seems to be a day-to-day -day, uh, managed, uh, politically managed, the economic policy managed from a day-to-day -day basis, from a uh, basis of day-to-day -day decisions. The Mercosur, which was considered as a very hopeful regional integration system, is not really working. And uh, the credits, uh, the Brazilians, uh, uh, for the, as, as the, the taxes increased and the credit facilities increased, uh, there's a kind of bubble uh, on, the, on, the, on the credit uh, system. And so that means that the credits are not really sustainable on the, on the long run. <laughs> Now that were the weak, the weak points, and the positive, but the positive points, they are also very important. We have a growing middle class in Brazil. 40 million, of, 40 million people in the last 10 years came up from the poor strata to the middle class strata. We have a large, a very large internal market, about 200 million people in Brazil. That is uh, quite an asset. An asset. Uh, we have a huge demand because of the, 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 the growth, the economic growth and the growth of the middle class. We have a huge demand for consumer, for consumer goods. Uh, we have well Brazil is quite well prepared for external crisis. They have a, uh, uh, a quite uh, uh, important monetary reserves, 370 billions of, of US dollars. And uh, they have a... Uh, uh, in, in comparison to other countries, uh, quite an, an, a, a stable institutional framework um, that helps them to prevent uh, 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 crisis uh, or, or to, 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 to stand uh, foreign crisis. There are, there are no wars. Brazil don't have wars. They don't have enemies. They are friendly and they are considered as friends all over the world. Uh, nobody, I didn't here, I don't know whether you, but I didn't hear nobody who said, oh, these Brazilians are terrible people, and so on. <laughs> nobody. Everybody loves Brazilians. This is an, a certain advantage in international business and international politics. Brazil produces uh, everything, almost everything, what it consumes, it, could, it is able to produce by itself. <laughs> that means that this is, in a certain way, independent. For example, 90% of the cars used in Brazil. We have in Brazil a per capita uh, uh, rate of uh, uh, cars per thousand inhabitants similar to New York. Uh, about uh, 400 cars per thousand, per thousand people in, in the meantime. Um, that was the data, that are the data from last year. 90% um, of those cars sold in Brazil are produced and or assembled in Brazil. <laughs> That's very important. That, that, that leads to the fact that Volkswagen do Brasil is considered by the Brazilians as a Brazilian enterprise, not as a German enterprise, as a Brazilian enterprise. After 60 years of uh, successful performance in the, in, the, in the Brazilian market, Brazil has natural resources of all kinds, from oil and gas to wood, vegetables, agricultural goods, copper, fruits, uh, water, uh, and others, namely. Uh, and Brazil has almost no <coughs> natural disasters. There is uh, usually there are no floods, there are no catastrophes, uh, earthquakes, and such kind of things. So these are uh, giving a, a, a positive uh, uh, perspective and a positive framework for, for, for development. Conclusion: Brazil requires political reforms, especially 
the political party system is with 36 or 38 political parties quite uh, 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 not very uh, helpful for the for the decision making process and for the uh, democracy development process in in, in Brazil. Um, they need uh, infra infrastructure improvement. Uh, they uh, didn't invest uh, a lot of money in infrastructure, and as a large country, they need <coughs> roads. They need rail. They have all, all, almost no real rail system. They need uh, them to modernize their ports and their harbors. They need to modernize the airports. They have a good chance now because of also of the uh, the football. Uh, 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 world Championship and of the Olympic Games uh, to do a lot of things, but uh, it, has to, it has to be done and it, it was not done in the last 20 years. They have to invest in, in education, uh, basic education and especially in vocational training. Uh, they don't have enough uh, specialist technicians and so on in order to uh, improve and to, 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 to support the, the industrial plans, the industrial development plans of the country. They have to improve productivity and, the com and competitiveness because actually, we heard it in the morning already, the markets are quite closed, uh, the uh, national industry is protected and this leads to a, a lack of productivity and this leads uh, to a lack of competitiveness. On the short term, this could be beneficial for the country because the country has a 200 million uh, 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 large internal market but on the mid and long term, this, this will be uh, this will uh, impede uh, further further development. Um, Brazil considers itself already part of the Champions League, uh, but in reality, I would say they have still to pass a, a hard uh, qualifying process. Uh, I would say uh, uh, they are also a bit uh, in the situation of this high expectation trap, which was mentioned this morning, uh, because the. The, the rapid and quick development of the last decade, especially of the last decade, led to a, 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 a led the new middle classes and the, the new educated uh, young people uh, expect, expecting much more than the state is able to deliver in the, in the, in the moment. Uh, and uh, this led already to this uh, uh, demonstration, to this violent acts and so on and so forth. This is quite a a challenge for the for the country, but I I'm optimistic. I think on the midterm and on the long term, there are positive <coughs> perspectives uh, if they manage to implement these uh, uh, mentioned reforms. Uh, there are more chances and opportunities than, than risks for, for Brazil and for the strategic uh, uh, partnership with with Germany. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, thank you first of all for timekeeping. Uh, you did fairly well. And this means we have actually one hour left. I propose that we may skip the coffee break and just have a, have a um, extended discussion. Um, actually, you were, uh, it was quite interesting to have your professional experience and, and your knowledge related to the newly industrialized, uh, newly industrializing countries. Um, and you touched upon many different aspects and dimensions, and I think this opens up perfectly the floor for um, your questions. So please indicate um, and, and show your reaction, comments, or, or the question you want to pose. Gentlemen. Just one question I have. We, we are talking a lot about chances and challenges. But are there clear criterion that would differentiate chance and challenges from each other when it goes to world economy? the established order and the, so to say, the challenges of emerging economies. These, are there any clear criterion lines that we could differentiate challenge from chance? I will collect another question. Any, anybody at the moment? Well, I, that's a fairly difficult question anyway, so, so who, is, uh, who would like to go forward? Perhaps I try. I, I was uh, presenting my storyline, perhaps a little bit naive, in believing in markets. So in, I, I would like to provocate you a little bit. 
uh, and your question is perhaps in this direction. And of course we see the challenge um, of environmental protection, climate protection, social issues and so on. Um, this is definitely uh, a big challenge. We cannot only dream uh, of growth uh, in the same model we had it in the West. So we have to turn on the sustainability issue and bring in these new concepts of uh, yeah, all things related to sustainability uh, thinking to the um, to the to the to the BRICS countries and all others. Africa is not only uh, related to BRICS, but all the neue Gestaltungsmächte as well, of course. And uh, this is a major challenge. Uh, it's not only uh, selling cars. It's selling a new. Uh, concept of mobility, it's uh, selling uh, wealth and better lifestyle um, at a price you can uh, pay. Of course there will be an ecological price, no doubt, but it must be balanced to um, the benefit um, in these countries uh, bringing up wealth. And this is, uh, I think, again both to your question, is chance and challenge. The Chinese, by the way, perhaps somebody uh, have heard it, uh, in the 90s, everybody was bored, uh, if you listen to this quote, that the Chinese sign for crisis is combining chance, the sign for chance and challenge in one single uh, icon. And that's a typical uh, Chinese concept. It's not only black and white, it's all connected. Uh, you don't have only a challenge and only a chance, and you cannot really separate it. The challenge is the chance. Uh, can, it depends on your perspective and your solution. And so I, I couldn't find criteria really to distinguish between these two realms. Uh, yes, I would, uh, I would say, I think uh, the question, challenges, challenges and chances, it is uh, related to each other. I think we are thinking, we, are, we have to see uh, the necessity to, to make a kind of, to jump from uh, just a quantitative approach to a qualitative approach, from a uh, from a, a, pop a popularity success to a sustainable uh, to sustainable policy, and this is this is the, these are the differences. And I think this uh, the first is a challenge because the the leaders are already uh, uh, confronted with the, with the challenges. Yeah. So now they have to go a step a step a step further. And I uh, just I forgot to, to mention one point regarding Brazil. It was there was a foreign research group doing uh, analysis and research in Brazil at the beginning of the year. And they they came to an interesting phrase sentence to as a conclusion. They said Brazil is politically underestimated and economically overestimated. And this is a kind of truth, I would say. I I can understand that perfectly. Living there and and and. and uh, taking notice on the kind of discussions and on the issues I mentioned before, uh, economically overestimated because of 10, 15 years of permanent growth without creating the structure, the, 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 uh, the, the, the respective structures for a, for, a sustainable, for a sustainable growth and politically underestimated because Brazil managed to get into almost all important international organizations to widen their shares to, uh, 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 to get more uh, uh, responsibility and more uh, votes in different international organizations and therefore, and they managed to get uh, allies, in, especially in the south, south uh, 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 sphere, uh, to, uh, to introduce their demands in the international, uh, in the national, international state. Send me to make a little bit can create a question when I would talk about challenge. I, I refer to these three phenomena mentioned just on the screen. You know, challenges towards liberal democracy, market economy, and international order. These emerging economies, how kind of challenges they pose or create towards these three, so to say, mentioned phenomena there, to make it a little bit concrete. And maybe take the, the, the last issue first, the issue of international order, because that's something um, Mr. Loka has already addressed. Maybe you could elaborate a bit more. Well, yes, but it's a question whether, demo if I understand you right, the question of whether democracy or a sort of state 
led or more autocratic uh, system is better um, in, 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 in developing economically a because the context, economy, because, because the context may I a little bit explain mm -hmm. because the context is that these emerging economies and countries would probably create challenges to the to the world, you know, uh, as we discussed here, you know, is written chance and challenges for liberal democracies, market economy, and international order. But the question is, what kind of challenges these emerging economies would create? Of course, what we have already mentioned, the scarcity of, uh, <coughs> of water supply, of food, very important, and uh, of other um, raw materials um, can, of course, uh, uh, can of course lead to to, to, to violent clashes. Uh, we, we know the scenarios of think tanks uh, on the on, on, on those those issues. This is uh, well known. If there, that's why I was sort of stressing the issue that the, the reform of the, inter of the international uh, order accepted by everybody is so is so important. And not only let this process um, uh, develop um, uh, at ease. Um, China, the, maybe the most, uh, the single most important issue of this um, uh, of this globalization thing is, uh, as, as we read, starting to sort of secure their um, its uh, its uh, raw material import from from Africa and Latin America. Um, of course, this could lead to uh, uh, to uh, sort of uh, competition. Yeah, you know. Maybe on the climate issue is an area that one can look at. We hosted COP17 a couple of years back, and South Africa is a big emitter. You know, we're a big polluter, um, like other countries. Um, you know, so in areas like that, um, you, you know, you need to bring the parties around the table, and they need to work together, otherwise the international system is going to suffer. You, you know, everyone will suffer. You know, our children suffer, their children suffer. So. You know, I think climate, you know, highlights the necessity of um, working together. Also, energy, perhaps. You know, those are, you know, if you don't address the challenges, you know, then, you know, they, they, they're going to be, um, you know, environmental consequences, you know, for, you know, for future generations. And that's you know, a big imperative to, you know, for the need to work together, you know, on one specific issue. I have another question to Councillor Matters um, on a related topic, not climate, but investment climate. How has uh, the investment climate in South Africa's mighty mining sector evolved um, as compared to um, the investment climate in other raw material extracting countries in Africa, such as Namibia, for instance, with its nationalization uh, tendencies? You know, I think the national, nationalization debate um, has been put to rest. There, there's no, you know, the, the nationalization tendency, there's no tendency towards nationalization. It was one individual within a party belonging to a small group. When the, um, the the leading party in government had the last um, national meeting, you know that issue it, it was closed. You know it, it, our ministers have come out to say, you know there's no movement to nationalise the mines. So you know in organisations, we're a democratic country. In in, in parties, you know there, there is um, debate within in parties. So. Um, you know, I think the nationalization debate, um, you know, that, you know, the person um, who was Julius Malema, who was, you know, running with that debate, is no longer within the party. You know, he's established his own party to compete in the next elections in, in April. But I think in terms of the, you know, if you look at the um, underlying reasons why, you know, these issues come to the fore, when you've got extreme poverty, you know, high unemployment among youth, um, you know, over 50% unemployed youth, you know, then you've actually got a, a huge um, and a vocal um, support base, you know, and the government, they need to do something to, you know, address the, the job creation issue, you, you know, because otherwise, 
um, you know, there will become, you know, populist slogans become then um, more attractive. You know, on the mining specifically, you, you know, um, I, I know that legislation has been amended and I'm not really an expert on the mining sector, so I wouldn't like to perhaps venture into, you know, one specific region. But I can tell you what, what for us was another big concern, you know, was the bilateral investment treaties. Last week, South Africa cancelled the bilateral investment treaty with Germany. You know, it was a, from the embassy side, you know, we told by the German chamber, um, you know, for German SMEs to go into your country, um, Mr. Kochanka, the ambassador at um, the Auswärtige Amt, he says, you know, you need a, a spine of arrangements, you need a bilateral investment uh, um, agreement and a double taxation treaty. So if people come to him and you haven't got those, hey, it's, a, it's like a big issue. They can't advise them to go to your country. You know, from our side, you know, we're in the awkward position. we the foreign ministry, and it's an initiative taken by the trade minister. You know, our minister signs the letter, but it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a trade initiative. And what the... So our arguments then, hey, we've got to wear the trade hat now and say yes, um, you know, we've got internal constant, you know, the internal issues, we're busy negotiating a, a global um, free trade agreement. You know, we've stopped bilateral investment treaties with four EU countries. Germany was the most recent, but the reason why? Because we're actually looking at this global arrangement. You know, but also we're unhappy about it. You know, we write to Pretoria and say, hey, we're unhappy, but, you know, we deal with the... On, on Thursday, when we go meet with the DEHK and the Chambers and the Economics Ministry, you know, I'm sure we'll have a long, you know, debate further on this. But it's, you know, I mean, you know, we here, we've got to state, you know, what the facts are. It's like that. Um, <clears throat> before we, we get to the next question of the gentleman in the back, actually, I'd suggest to forward your question to Mr. Niedermark and maybe making it a little bit broader in asking if we talk about threats, nevertheless, the kind of state-organized or state interventionist policies existing in many uh, emerging economies, in, in what ways uh, uh, do they affect like a, a company like uh, PSF and what, like, what is your response to that? Is, is this a threat actually? Um, yeah, it's a difficulty. Uh, of course, uh, we like investment climate where we can uh, invest in similar circumstances as we can in North America or Europe. Um, but we normally don't find uh, these investment climates. Uh, look at China again. Uh, we had uh, two phases. The first one where uh, when we were really welcome bringing in the products, simply investing in huge factories producing the stuff. And uh, nobody was asking how. It was not appreciated, appreciated how we did it, it was appreciated that we did it. Today, China is of course in a position to brew acrylic acid on their own. No problem for Chinese companies. But afterwards, the, uh, the fish is dead in the river and uh, you have yellow clouds and so on. So today, the investment climate is completely different. Our entry ticket is not that we produce at all, but that we produce in a sustainable manner, without uh, accidents and without high emissions and so on. That's the only way we get into the market. Um, they can do it in the meantime alone. So, polyurethane foams is not a secret, it's simple chemicals. You cannot add emotion to it. There's no branding to acrylic acid here. Uh, there's just a chemical formula, and if you have it, you do it. And um, so, the question is the sustainability issue. I cannot overstress it. And this is also, for example, in, in Africa investment. Uh, if we need minerals from Africa, uh, it's of course absolutely crucial that these are um, gained in a sustainable way. Otherwise, we cannot use them. We are forced to prove to our customers that within our value chain, everything is in order. So if you are connected to child labor or to environmental uh, sins, then uh, we cannot sell our products any longer to Nestle and to Procter and Gamble. They ask us 
is the chemicals you are providing to us, is it produced in a sustainable manner? So the investment climate will change. Um, African nations must take care on such things. Uh, I see that there are problems now, Chinese uh, competitors coming in and not uh, already th that must focus, but this is a question of competition in the long run, and it will only take a few years that these international standards will be common, I hope so, um, and um, I think it will um, uh, go this way. And then we are in a very good competition uh, set up uh, since we are already there. We, we have the sustainability approach. And um, that is the, the differentiation uh, issue. It's not only tariffs and land use and such things. That is, you can handle all these things. Um, it's more about the, the way of uh, investment you are doing. And then uh, I think we are uh, on a very good way, like countries with um, South Africa who have understood that. My name is Ken. I'm from Myanmar, from mm -hmm. Burma. My question will be related to Mr. Myanmar Dilemma of the RSF. Example, China. The great challenge will be the protection of environment. All of us, we know that in China, over 30 years, average economic growth is about 9.2 or something like this. But environment, soil, is wild. The air is very touchy. Water is a great pollution, 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 pollution. So how will be the environment protected in China? If you ask every population of Peking, Shanghai, and Nika City in China, they said, I will be fresh air, I will be pure water, I will be good food. So how can you uh, fulfill their desire? Um, just for my data background, I brought a presentation here and you have some pictures on China with the pollution and the protests. So you, meanwhile, you have 80,000 demonstrations a year uh, against environmental pollution and you have a strong political will of Chinese urban population to fight against this uh, yeah, environmental sins. And so there is um, a certain process of, of uh, recognition in China, we, we strongly feel, um, that they uh, change the way of uh, yeah, investing into industry, what I told you before. And for you, as a really uh, the, the latest uh, interesting country on the scene, uh, now entering global economy perhaps, uh, step by step, will be a long process, um, of course, you can learn from that very strongly and uh, can, can, can learn that you do not repeat all these mistakes. And th that would create for you the challenge of self-restriction in a way. Yeah? Uh, you cannot uh, do it in the Chinese style immediately. And by the way, we as BSF wouldn't uh, get into your country immediately and build a big plant because of your Yatkuna gas fields uh, reserves. Yeah? That's not the concept for your country. It must be a relatively slowly process. I, I know that your population is also longing for a better lifestyle, definitely. They, they want all these nice products uh, the rest of the world is enjoying. And uh, you must be very careful to keep that in balance. But um, yeah, don't repeat the, uh, the Chinese mistakes and companies like ours and many Western companies. It's not only ours, we are not the only ones uh, they have understood. And if you rely on those companies, it's, it's uh, the best concept. By the way, um, uh, it's a personal remark. I opened the first business office in uh, Myanmar, 1996, um, and uh, had strong hopes that we have the process, which is now started already mid of the uh, 90s, was not possible, and I'm very happy that it's not going started. 
and uh, I think that is the most sympathetic uh, country in the region. I, I love it. But it's just a personal remark. Sure. Next. Next one. <coughs> My name is Devashish Bhadubi. I came from Calcutta. I'm a German engineer and MBA. In my life, I couldn't allow myself to retire in this country, but today I'm retired. You understand me? Mm -hmm. From profession, I'm retired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Mr. Nirama, the government of India prefer to work a cooperation. Are you working in India, cooperating with Indian companies or Indian products? Because you know the traditional Indian medicine with the European school medicine has got a very big future in the industry of the other countries. And I would like to thank Mr. Narke and ask you if you please allow me to say a couple of words, what you said very nicely to us today about the development of middle class. This morning there were discussions about the population growing in India and uh, the middle class in India, the government is making so that every year 12,5 million Indians, they come from poverty to the middle class. Mr. Obama, I just said the name and after that please forget that, told at the <laughs> Indian parliament that the middle class population in India it's more than the total population in USA. And the result is that, that the development of population in India and middle class is negative since last decade. <coughs> I just inform you that today and tomorrow is very, very high expectation. All of India is waiting. If everything went all right, then today at 10 o'clock in the morning, India have sent the first rocket to Mars, and they will come back in about 18 months' time. And tomorrow, the most famous cricketer of India will be playing his farewell game, test match, against Right, Honorable Mr. Medhurst against South African cricket team at Eden Gardens in Calcutta. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I can be very quick. Um, of course, we are also engaged in India, uh, also investing some hundred millions now in Gujarat uh, in new plants. We have been there for 50 years, so everything is a little bit slower than in China, but in general, our expectation to uh, have new markets in India is comparable somehow. For the time being, the gap is even widening mm -hmm. because India is so slow and uh, China is so quick. So, But in the long run, we are also bullish on India. What I wanted to say, we are not in pharmaceuticals, so I cannot answer your question on uh, the medicine. But um, I know that in pharmaceuticals, we have a lot of problems with intellectual property rights in India, more than in China. Yeah. It's not that everything is nice in India because it's a democracy and everything is wrong in China because it's not a democracy. The intellectual property issue for us and Bayer, our colleagues, uh, friendly competitors, uh, in yeah, they have a lot of problems in India with uh, patents and intellectual property rights. And um, India has to be careful um, that they integrate in the system a little bit more and not uh, just playing the democratic card and everything allowed is allowed in India. So we strive for level playing field, and that must be also um, valid for India. Thank you. <coughs> Can I just, um, sure. I just like to add, um, you know, Sachin Tendulkar, the yeah. Indian cricketer, is like the Lionel Messi of Barcelona, mm -hmm. but he's for all cricket. So. Perhaps we can have a bilateral about this later. <laughs> we appreciate him in South Africa. Uh, maybe I'd like to take up your question or your comment actually on the middle class and, and want to relate it to a bigger or a different question. Because I'm, I'm not sure everybody talking here about middle class in newly industrialized countries, is it really the same kind of thing we are talking about? Is the middle class in Brazil 
India, China, and many other countries, really the same kind of thing. So should we use the same term? And I'm not so sure. Maybe uh, somebody wants to comment. Yeah, that's what I was. Maybe you can tell us. That's the. Uh, if we hear, if we hear or use the term middle class, we think of a certain, uh, not only of, an, of a certain income, but um, of certain behavior, like you tend to save money uh, to buy a house, to look after the education of your children, to buy a German car, to um, <laughs> yeah, to, to um, uh, you have spare time and money to think about um, environmental questions and so on. So there's a, there comes a whole uh, behavior with it, uh, and maybe it's a bit too optimistic to um, uh, presume that this is the same thing uh, in uh, China, India, and I don't know, Nigeria and South Africa. This may be something you could, you yeah, could tell us. Midclass in India, according to my observation, is like in Germany, you know, when they come to this middle class standard, they have their consumer goods at home with their fridge, with their 3D TV and so on. And what they mostly try to bring their children to a renovated school or college, paying a heavy lot of money to that. And that's very big insurance to them. When they come out from that school, the future has been guaranteed to them. And then they make their health insurance their children, their house, their cars, and so on. They start with the motorbike, and the wife is going to work so that they have little time. And also, the family is becoming smaller. There's a negative effect. They, they think about their own family, and most of the families, they have only one or two children. That's the way they think. It's not like in Singapore, you know, where you come to a social tenement house where the parents are living and the young couple comes there, they give 33% less rent to them. But in India, you know, this is extreme capitalist country and they must think about themselves. And they think that way. Also for the future. Because in government service they have their they have their, their pensions. But in private they must do for themselves. So this way they are thinking making a house, having a German car, and so on. But the main thing, the philosophical idea of the family is that the education of the children. And it's, it's not only consumption. Um, I, I remember a, a vacation we spent in Goa in a very simple and cheap but middle class hotel, and there were only Indians. And my children and their children, they could easily speak about everything, pop music, and American TV screen uh, serials and fashion and all these and, and textbooks, comics, asterix, all this stuff. So uh, it's not only the German car and so on, but uh, you, you find a certain level of uh, lifestyle and interest uh, which goes uh, global. And that my, that's my uh, personal uh, opinion on, on middle class and not only income rates and, and such things. So, to, to, to I would. <coughs> I would say the first, the first thing is the hunger for consumption because those people who were not able to buy consumer goods for a long time, even their, maybe their fathers, their family was not able to buy that. They have the first attempt is to be able to, be, uh, uh, to buy a cell phone, uh, to buy a, wash, a washing machine or, or a fridge or, or whatever. And then the next, in the next stage, what you mentioned, I would consider that the next the next stage after the satis after satisfying the basic consumption needs, uh, then things are education and uh, uh, professional uh, professional outcome for the future and, and, and so on. Environment environment is even even late, later uh, consciousness for environment and so on. But at, at least what I am I have observed in Latin America for a long time is that. The people who have the chance to come out of this daily survival uh, uh, war, uh, that they uh, co first they consume, and then uh, the other things are, are come. And this is, I think, this is an important. This is an, also an important, uh, uh, a, a important uh, uh, point, uh, focal point for the.
for the in, for the industry. And you can see that, uh, that if you see the the numbers of cars and the numbers of mobile phones sold in, in Brazil in the last years in comparison to the years before, even uh, and, and to the and in comparison to the uh, to the national to the income to the monthly income, it's impressive. It's really impressive. Uh, they have this uh, higher number of cell phones in Brazil per capita than, than we have here. Yeah. So, what about production standards? Uh, some weeks ago, I went to the supermarket to buy some baby food for the baby, my son. Uh, I suppose it was Mr. Hip who had a little writing, and he excused that all this uh, food was going to Asia especially to China. Um, are there no rules or laws or warning or how uh, can I imagine this? What, what is going on there? So that um, the people there don't trust their own food industry. It's again, again the same story. Sustainability thinking in China is awakening. So many middle class people from China who have the chance to come to Germany buy all this stuff. Of course, we also observed it that in Prenzlauer Berg there is a shortage of hip products. Yeah. It's no joke, it's, not, it's, it's real. Yeah? And um, that's exactly our business model. We bring in the better products and we even produce it uh, on the spot. Take, for example, softeners. Uh, you know, this stuff you need to make the plastics flex flexible and not that hard. You find it in, in toys, for example, even in medical instruments and so on. And of, you, of course you need better softeners, uh, which do not harm your health. We have them, and uh, we can sell them for a very good price in China, meanwhile. That is what I meant with uh, the, the opportunity we find. The Chinese people are no longer accepting, gradually, not all of them, but gradually, these poor products harming their uh, environment, harming their personal health, and so on. And that's, for us, as an advanced high-tech company, a very big chance to get into these markets to, to have the better sustainable products and production methods. And of course, there are difficulties and, and uh, some yeah, funny uh, uh, phenomena uh, like this one with the hip. Uh, I think you can solve it within one season next next year uh, they will double production and sell directly and that, that people don't have to come to Berlin and uh, they will open shops I'm sure in Beijing. It's a big chance. Anybody else to comment on this question? So we take another two questions please. Thank you. Danny, I think I do German pass about for regulations and my question would go to Mr. Niedermarken. How do you see the quality of uh, economic cooperation and competition with Chinese partners, especially from the perspective of the protection of intellectual property, and from the perspective of the often emerging charges of Chinese industrial espionage against European and German companies. I'm sorry, I don't want to dominate the panel. Uh, gentleman here, please. I thought there was a... Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, Thilo Schwitter from Friedrich Naumann Foundation from the International Politics Division. Um, so I think I guess we talked a lot about the individual develop or the developments in the individual countries. Um, so I'd like to talk about the broader phenomenon of the rise of the emerging powers, um, especially uh, relating to the one one pillar of the international order as we know it. So free trade and liberalization of trade. Um, I would be interested to hear whether, like you from an industry perspective, but also you from the um, from the government perspective, um, how, how whether you would see that the political rise of the emerging powers in fora such as the G20, the BRICS, IPSA, and so on, um, has changed the debate on uh, trade liberaliz liberalization. So. Is there like a counter movement to trade liberalization that has gained power through this political rise, or um, is not is that not a worry at all? Thank you. Of course, what we observe is a fragmentation of the um, of the negotiations on, on free trade agreements, um, even intra-regional 
uh, negotiation like between Mercosur and the EU is not really <laughs> advancing uh, at high speed. So you, you fall you fall back to, to to think about why don't we do it bilaterally with the with Brazil or so if it's not functional with Mercosur. So we have a going uh, backwards into more fragmentation, and this will be, I think, for the for time for the foreseeable future, the uh, uh, the future a uh, or even uh, every time more complicated system of bilateral and regional um, agreements all over the world, which makes it, it, that's a pity, it makes it very complicated, but I don't see any, at the moment, no, no other way out. I always hope one day it will be find ourselves back at the Doha round or the next, whatever it will then be called, at the WTO. But at the moment, it's the hour for fragmentation. Um. Of course, uh, since we are engaged in all parts of the world, we are really heavily interested in uh, trade liberalization. Since we are one of those industries who are still suffering from tariffs, what I told you, we have relatively small margins. Um, acrylic acid is like it is. You cannot add 30% value by branding it with Audi. Um, so we, for us, a 3% tariff is still uh, yeah, uh, relevant. But what we have learned is that we have to be very patient. And um, if you start your, some students perhaps here, start your career in, um, in trade liberalization processes and in trade negotiations, you have a job for a lifetime. Okay. Um, that's, that's the experience. And, um, but our concept is in cooperation, and that leads me to your question, um, with the Chinese, for example, which are so strong now in the international markets, we have to find, in, in, in a cooperation way, uh, that they understand our way of market-oriented uh, thinking. And uh, the best way we think we could do it, inviting them to be active here, invest in North America, invest in Europe, and learn the rules of the game. Yeah? And so uh, what we advocate for is open borders for Chinese investment. Uh, it's absolutely no problem for BISF to have an, a larger Chinese investment in our company. No problem for us. I think it would be uh, for politics um, if Ludwigshafen would be perhaps uh, owned by uh, the Chinese. But for the company itself, from our thinking, it wouldn't be a problem. It could also be an American. We, we don't want to be sold but to anybody. It doesn't matter whether it's a Chinese. Uh, it's a different story. But once we are sold, or uh, yeah, it can be a Chinese or an American, and then they have to play along the same rules here. And that's our way uh, of, of getting into this um, status of level playing field and same treatment in every market. And uh, your example of intellectual property right is a perfect one, because we see a very quick development over only 10 to 12 years, how China learned how important it is to protect intellectual property. Meanwhile, you have more cases within China, Chinese company versus another Chinese company in intellectual property issues than with foreigners. And um, they really quickly understood how important it is, typical for China, by the way, the, the, the speed in China of understanding such processes is very high. And um, so I'm also very optimistic when it comes to norms and standards electromobility, for example, that we have a global standard, I think they will quickly understand um, that there's also a benefit for them, a mutual benefit. So our concept is to have mutual trust and understanding and open uh, investment conditions in both directions. Also, if they come here and if they buy German middle class companies, that's not a problem. Yeah, like Putzmeister. Nice. Then Putzmeister has new capital, a new owner, a new market access on China, and it's not a disaster for German if Putzmeister is owned by a Chinese company. And that's a way we think uh, it will go forward in a very positive way. By the way, we are strongly engaging on that. Our deputy CEO is speaker for German business on China, but it's not only on business. He's also chairman of a German-Chinese body on civil society, so talking about culture, about happiness, about school books of children, what is the perception and so on. So we are heading such groups in talk about absolutely political issues, not only business, in order to create this mutual trust. That's the concept. It's not always easy, but 
we are believing in that. Yeah, uh, uh, talking about uh, protection, uh, protectionism, uh, I think uh, there's a bit of a vicious circle because what I said that the, the Brazilian enterprises has, uh, are showing a low productivity. That has to do because there is no, they, they, there is no uh, competi real competition because the foreign products are, are really expensive and uh, they, the Brazilian enterprises are protected. So we have to, I think we have to, uh, 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 we have to stimulate the, our partners in Brazil to invest more in research, in education, in vocational training, uh, and so on, in order to improve the productivity. And when the productivity is more or less improved, then uh, they are able to compete. If not, they will disappear, and therefore the politicians don't like to open the, the markets and don't like to open the the uh, uh, the, border, the borders for, for 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 foreign products because they know exactly that their enterprises are not able to stand this uh, competition. So this is a vicious circle, and, and uh, I think on midterm the president has to the president and others they have to. Uh, to do something there to interrupt this uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, and not favorable uh, situation for, for them. Yeah, I'd just like to add on, a, I don't want to talk about um, trade liberalization, but you know, one of the challenges that we find, um, you know, with one of our products coming into the EU market, you know, for the past 30 years, um, Germans eat South African citrus in your summer. And, you know, then all of a sudden, um, you know, we get um, told that it's dangerous. You know, you've only had, there's a black spot that that's on the on the fruit, and if you and if um, you know when the containers come in, if they find five transgressions, in other words, if they find five oranges with this black spot on it, then it can't no longer come into the EU market. You know, and that's from uh, Brussels. Yeah. Um, a, a Brussels regulation. You know, now if we've been, this sector, they export um, 500,000 tons this year of citrus to the European market. Most of it comes into North Europe. Here it's too cold for the, for the bacteria or the spot to grow on the fruit. So it's something that actually affects the southern markets that also grow the citrus that compete for market share in your market. You know, so those are, um, you know, South Africa, we've got very good scientific evidence that proves, you know, um, this, it's not harmful, okay? But yet from an EU level, we get told, you know, it's like this. You know, and that's um, one of the issues I think from emerging countries and developing countries. You know, you know, we've got good systems and scientists in South Africa that um, you know regulate and have traceability of products back um, to the crop where it's grown. But if you look at the rest of Africa, and in, and you know what's you know how much opportunity is the rest of Africa going to have to export agriculture, which a uh, Africa is suitable for agricultural growth into this market if we're struggling to get in with those strict regulations. You know, and that's not harmful to humans. Very difficult. Uh, uh, may I add something? Uh, because you are also a country of uh, very good wines. Now in the German vineyards you have a huge problem. It's a very small fly coming from Asia and uh, they really destroy the whole vineyard and it's a horrible problem also for our top scientists how to stop this and they have a loss it's money you lose no? and you know that germany is also a good wine producer and the farmers they have a lot of problems and the institutes working really day and night to find out what is uh, the reason how uh, can we destroy it? And they say, before they didn't come uh, to Germany, but now in general, the climate is becoming warmer and warmer step by step. 
though they can survive here much better. If, if you go back to your point, actually, I would like to, to ask you something. So the argument you, you are making actually is that it's not only the problem that emerging economies should deregulate or liberate their uh, uh, economies, but it's also a heavy trade barriers in place in, 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 the, in the European Union and also in North America, right? That's, yeah. that's actually, so it's a mutual problem in a way. Right? It's not just one side has to deregulate or has to open up, so it's, it's also a problem of, of market barriers uh, in, in Europe very much. And I think that's a very important uh, point to, to take home. Okay, we have time for another round of two or three questions. So um, I would um, actually like to um, to misuse my uh, position as chair of the panel and, and ask the panelists one uh, uh, one final question. And actually, it's uh, very much related to the, the the headline of the the whole conference. Do you think it's really uh, it, it really makes sense to treat all the industrialized newly industrializing countries or however we call them uh, in one group? Because given the diversity, given the, 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 the similar, similarities on the one hand, but the, the huge differences on the other hand, does it really make sense to put them all into one group? And, and, and given your answer, what would be the main point of a, a strategy towards them from a German point of view? No, by no means we are putting everybody in the same basket, um, and even... Um, um, what, what we, um, I must admit that I don't look at this issue so much from, the, from a 100% economical point of view, because I think what, what, we, what we call our Gestaltungsmächte, um, for, uh, to be a Gestaltungsmacht for, in our view, you should have uh, this sort of economic uh, uh, growth, stable economic uh, growth, or already you reached a certain a certain level and a political and a, a regional a role in your region and the political um, will to um, um, participate in the, in the shaping of global uh, governance. Um, these three things are necessary. So um, I would even say that the Iran is a Gestaltungsmacht um, in this way and uh, Nigeria and other countries. So I, by no means I would put everybody uh, uh, to the same basket, and by, uh, therefore we are uh, trying to prepare uh, individual strategies for each of these uh, countries. I would like to add that uh, there are some similarities between these countries, uh, uh, but it is really, somebody asked uh, whether this, uh, this question here, emerging economies, chance and challenges for democracy, modern economy, the international order. I think this question is, not, we, we are not able to answer this question in, uh, for all the, the BRICS or for even for the, the second group of countries in, of emerging economies. But there are similarities and I think uh, from a governmental point of view from Germany, uh, we are looking for strategic partnerships and I think if we identify common interests with some of them or with all of them uh, or individually or, or in small groups, uh, we could work uh, uh, together in identifying areas of, of cooperation and areas of uh, uh, influencing the uh, international agenda uh, 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 on, on the discussion of certain certain topics, common goods, public goods, uh, environment, uh, organized crime, uh, 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 water supply, or, 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 or and, 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 and. There are a lot of fields, I think, uh, we would be able to uh, work significantly closer together than it uh, happened in the, in the past. And I think this is also uh, only possible because these countries came out of their uh, uh, basic needs uh, 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 orientation and now they are in another stage of uh, international discussion so this is uh, very uh, favorable for us and uh, we should uh, and the foreign ministry with this concept and with other ideas on cooperation and strategic partnership is, is working on this issue. 
Yeah, I think I answered your question in my introductory remarks that we have a clear concept for all of them and it justifies that we put them into one group. Uh, of course, we see the differences that one is democratic and the other one is autocratic. But for us as a company, and the, first of all, they are new markets with young, hungry populations who need more uh, products uh, in all kinds. And then our strategy is also everywhere the same, sustainability. It's only sustainability, with either it's Russia or Brazil or China. Without uh, sustainable solutions, you are not competitive. And so, yes, we put them into one group. There's the OECD and there are the BRICS or New Gestaltungsmächte, whatever you would like to call them. Um, but the, these are the new uh, uh, markets for us. I think from the South Africa side, we've got very good um, cooperation with Germany. And in terms of trilateral cooperation, maybe that's an area you know, where our partners from the GI said you know, we can do more with. Um, in terms of in the security area, um, you know, Germany um, you know, assists with the, with the African Union. So that's also, you know, it's, it's positives. But, um, you know, I think um, the German Foreign Ministry with their policy for shaping powers, you know, they, um, you know, they're covering it fairly well. Yeah. It's an interesting question whether, whether we should continue with our classical development aid with these, uh, at least with the, with the bigger or richer um, um, global powers or emerging powers. Um, I don't, I would say no, I mean, we, we stopped the, the, our bilateral development aid with China will run out in uh, 2014, but you can, always, you can also ask, do we have to continue to do this with India or Mexico, an OECD country already, Brazil or South Africa, or can we rather concentrate on uh, different um, political topics with these, with these countries, or collaborate in third countries, uh, trilaterally, as you said. But okay, I think Harald has a second slide. Yeah, sure. I have a second slide for the strategic partnership of Germany. <laughs> that's this one. <laughs> well, that's that's a wonderful closing picture, and actually, it, it mirrors uh, uh, probably uh, you anticipate this that we reached a point of, of cautious uh, contemplation on, on, on what might be the next steps and what might be the right step from a German point of view. And I think this question certainly will be with us the next 30 years. So it's not, not going away uh, uh, really. And um, I'd like to thank the panelists very much for their insights, for their comments, for their views. Uh, and I hope there will be some other uh, possibility to come together again and discuss this kind of questions.